I cited from my end, you cite from the Talmud. Authorities that you cited yes. from the Talmud, you cited the 13 principles from Rabbi no, no. Ishmael. Yes, what do you mean? Okay, there's, there's a few things that we spoke about, not just Ezekiel, first of all, on this point. Oh, right. We also mentioned um, uh, Abraham. And in the first oh, yes, of course. Right. Yes, so yes. You brought up Abraham with Isaac and um, you brought up Ibn Ezra. Um, yes. I, and, um, and what did I, I say about it? What did Ibn Ezra say? First of all, sorry, who is Ibn Ezra? Ibn Ezra was a, was a rabbi who lived in the, uh, the, 14th, the 13th century uh, in Spain. Um, and uh, he was one of the great commentaries. Would you say he's authoritative? Bible. Yeah, he is one of the authorities. Yes. Um, and you brought up a quote from Ibn Ezra, which I looked up and I didn't really see what you were getting at with the quote. Uh, what was the quote? That you wanted to say had to of navigation, I forget yeah. what it is. Okay, so maybe that's something we should recap yeah. if you forget it. Yeah, okay. So that was the Abraham and Isaac thing, the, the Bible yeah. thing. We spoke about the Ezekiel stuff. Yeah. And after all of that, you, uh, unless I'm forgetting anything, you moved on to speak about Isaiah 42. Right, yeah, exactly. Correct. I, I, I think you've got, the, you've got the timeline largely in place. Yes. There's a few things I think we need to kind of establish. We, we said that in order for a prophet to be a prophet, or that there's a new prophet coming after Moses, or we believe Jesus as well, obviously you don't. But if, if there's a new prophet, he has to fulfill certain biblical criterion. Yes. And we said that f for one, he has to preach in one God, worthy of worship, right? Indeed. And that's something you, you, you agree, you admit that is something which the prophet Muhammad did do. He spoke about one God worthy of worship. There's no controversy there. That, 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 there is a slight controversy, yes. but, but not, a, not a large one, which is the issue as to whether or not Muhammad preached divine simplicity or not. Right? right. Well, no, no. Of course, well, you as a... Yeah. Uh, did you say you're an Athari, did you say? Well, yeah, largely, and yeah. As an Athari, of course, you do not believe in divine simplicity. Well, no, I mean, here's the thing. Within, within Judaism and Christianity, these things are not even believed in. There's no unanimity or consensus there anyway. So in not, Judaism, yes, there is. I don't think there is. There, there, there aren't any rabbis that, um, that, 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 that I've ever heard of. All right. Well, let, that, me, let me ask you. Uh, that, that have not held divine simplicity. Well, 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 depends on how you define divine simplicity. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe God is merciful? Depends. Right? What do you mean by is God Is God powerful? Again, it depends what you mean by, 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 oh, oh. by God is something, right? Okay, when yeah. we say that God is something, yeah. are we saying that God possesses an attribute? Yes. Or are we simply describing God? Right? Both if of the, what you've just said that what you've just said here are the same thing. No, uh, 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 there's, there's two things. There's either he possesses attributes, right, that are, that, 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 that are distinct from him, right, from his essence, or no, but now you've 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 put a spanner in the woodworks yes. because now you're asking whether the distinction between the essence and the attribute. But that's not my question to you. Okay. Fine. My question to you was simply: Is is it is it intelligible to you? Is it befitting for me to describe God as all powerful? Yes or no? It is befitting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so, is this an intelligible meaning? Which so is this is God's power differentiated from His knowledge? No. So, okay, that means to say in your understanding that when I say God is all knowledgeable, proposition one, and I say God is all powerful, proposition two, that both of those propositions are the same. Sort of, and I'll explain why. Okay, I'll explain yeah, why. Yeah. Because the first word of each of those statements, God, in in Jewish terms, means both of those things, right? God is in essence all-powerful and is in essence all-knowledgeable. What does that mean? That means that there is no distinction between... No, no, when you say, sorry, I don't think you understand my question. When you say God is all-powerful, what do we mean by God is all-powerful? What are we trying to communicate here? It means that he has no limits into what he can do. Okay, and when we say he's all-knowledgeable, what does that mean? It means he has no limits in what he knows. Okay, so these two things are different, right? On a human level, yes. Okay, good. So that's now you've just you've just denied that reading of divine simplicity, which indicates that uh, different attributes are all the same. The, we on, actually, by the way, level, by the way, yeah. just so it, this is something similar to what we have a group in, in uh, proto Mortazilla. Mortazilla yes, group. we agree with them. Fine. N nevertheless, whether you agree with them or not, you've still not been able to solve this issue, which is that when we, we communicate in human language, and we say that look. 
God is all powerful. That means he has no limits to what he can do. Okay, obviously, except for the impossible things and stuff like that, which we've spoke about before. And when we say he's all knowledgeable, that means he's got no limits to his knowledge, meaning that there's no ignorance of God, there's no ignorance attributed to God. Now, in those two things, in human language that I'm speaking to and now, are intelligible to us as distinct features of God's or uh, attributes of God. So, would you agree with that or not? Not necessarily, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Because knowledge in itself is a power. I'm sure you would agree. No, it's, it's, we're talking about two different things here. Yeah, because when we say that God is all powerful, that He is limitless, right? Part of the fact that He is limitless, he, there is nothing He cannot do. No, but you're, is, is that He cannot not know. But what something. you're you're showing and uh, you're showing an overlap in two attributes is not you showing that these two things are the same. You're showing an aspect of overlap. You're not showing that they are two distinct things in all cases. For example, is God well, one second, is God alive? Is God alive? Yes. Has, does God have life? Have life. That's yes. A, yes. What, what does that okay. mean besides just put, being put sounds? life to the side? Does, let me, besides just being sounds, what uh, does no, that mean? Okay. Let me ask you a question. Can God hear? Again, b b besides just being sounds, what do you mean? No, no, but, but no. Besides, besides, besides being sounds. Yes. No, we're, we're not talking about besides sounds. Because hearing is. This, I mentioned this in part two because you because you brought up oh, what do you think about the Christians and the Trinity? And I said, well, it's uh, it, it's it, uh, and uh, uh, you said, can God be a man? I said, well, it's just sounds. It doesn't mean anything. The same applies here. When you say, yeah. can God do this? Can God do that? It's got actually got I to make no, sense. I didn't. No, 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 no. I didn't say, can God do this or can God do that? You I did. said, is God. Oh yeah, I said, can God hear? Yes. All right, so is God hearing? Is God is, all hearing? Is God all hearing? Yeah. Okay. I, I, is Let there me, anything that God cannot hear? Okay, no. yeah. No, good, great, good. Now we're talking, yeah? Now we're talking, uh, Josh. Let me ask another question. When the Bible says, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Achad, yeah? When it says that God is Achad. Yes. What does that mean? It means that there is no plurality. All right, so there's no plurality, pl there's God one. Yes. So one of the attributes. One of the attributes of God is oneness, correct? No, it's not an attribute. Oh, so what is it then? It's his very essence. His okay, very no, no. Being. But we're we're describing his essence now. If you want to call it that, for the sake of argument, can God be described as being one or not? Of course. Of course. Okay, so God is not two. God is not two. When we say God Excellent. is one. So if God there is, is no plurality. No problem. So God. if God is one, is the way that we describe God with oneness the same or different to the way we describe God as being all here, uh, all knowing? Repeat the question. Repeat the question. Is the way in which we describe God as being one the same or different to the way in which we describe God as being all knowledgeable? Is it the same? Are we talking about the same thing or are we talking about different things? We are in fact talking about the same thing. And oh, the reason okay. is because but, yes, the go reason ahead. is because yeah. the idea of oneness of God, i.e. the lack of plurality to yeah. God, is is in, is intrinsically the same as his limitless. And if uh, right, there are no limits okay. to God. So right? so you're saying God is speaking in tautology in the Bible? No. God is speaking in human terms in no, the Bible. No, you listen, this is what I'm saying. You're saying God is speaking when God says that he is one, Ahad, yes. or when he says that he is all, uh, or that he knows all, or that when he sees all, or that all of these things. The, 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 the third one, there isn't actually a Okay, fine. That. that he knows all, or that he's all powerful. There isn't a, that, that also is not said. So God is not des des described with power in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament? He's not described with all power, he's described, as, uh, he's described with power. Okay, great, because no problem. Uh, now, now we're playing semantics. You agree that God is all powerful, meaning there's no more powerful than God, right? I agree with you. Then. Okay, no problem. So, when God is described with power in the Bible, is that the same or different? You said the same as the oneness. Now, what I'm saying is, if that's the case, then God is speaking in tautology. It's meaning that he's saying the same thing twice in different language. It's, it, which means that there is a superfluous addition to the way in which God is describing himself. Number one. Number two is, you actually admitted in this discussion that when we say God is all knowledgeable, Versus, which means that he's no limits to his knowledge, versus God is all-powerful, which means that there's no limit to his power, let's say, except for that which is uh, impossibly understood, like uh, God can God create heavy, rocks or heavy uh, conundrum, which is nonsense, we would say. 
That, those two things, okay, those two things are different. You did say that. I did say that. I'd like to retract that. You want I, to retract that? Because I now see that that's, uh, that, that, that that's, that's actually not, not actually true. Okay. Because as I said after that, yes. the knowledge is a power. I'll allow you to retract that, but I want you to think about and ponder over why it is that you accepted that in the first place. Now, do you know why you accepted it in the first place? Let me, let me speculate. Josh. Let me speculate, Josh. I'll tell you what you think. This one, right? No, let me speculate, yeah, Josh. Speculate, Mohammed. I think the reason why you decided to say that there is a difference in our intelligible understanding of the proposition that God is knowledgeable or that there are no limits to his knowledge. God is power, there are no limits to his power because they are describing two different things. Now, now you are saying, now you're saying, actually, I want to retract that statement and I want to say that there are limits. The reason why you're doing that is not because of the logical argument presented in front of you. It is simply because you are trying to squeeze divine simplicity. You are trying to squeeze this idea that there are no actual attributes of God into the biblical discourse. There is nothing in the Bible, and I'll challenge you in fact, let me challenge you right now, Josh. There is nothing in the words of Moses or in the words of any of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, all 22 books in which you believe, 24, in which you believe, that says that what you're saying now. There is not one verse that says in the way in which we should understand the attributes of God should be anything other than a prima facie understanding. There's nothing at all. You are inventing that. No. That's up. Yes, you are. It means uh, uh, yeah. It means like apparent. apparent. That we, when, you, when God says that, he's, it's like ahad. Yeah, we, we take that on face value. We don't try and manipulate that. So anyway, that's the first thing. Second, sorry. Now let's get to the point because I, I, we could talk about this all day. Because, you, because can can you, can respond, you can respond. You can respond. You may be. You may be slightly correct in your assumption that on a prima facie reading of the Tanakh that one does not necessarily come to the conclusion of divine simplicity. You may be slightly correct on that. But the problem is there is no such thing as a prima facie reading of the Tanakh because a prima facie reading of the Tanakh on its, uh, right, without anything else is one is something you cannot read. There are no vowels, there, are no, there, there is no, no meaning. No. It necessitates an oral law. You, you've, it you've misunderstood. An oral Torah. And in the oral Torah, we have descriptions of divine simplicity. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The Rambam brings this down. Right? He's not the only one. The Chovas al brings this, brings this down. It's very, it's very clear from Rabbi Sora, right? brought down in the Torah Shabbat al Peh, that this is a, an essential um, principle of belief in God. Okay, no problem. I'll just ask you one question and then we'll move on to the next bit because yeah. I, I'll remind you of something. I said to you, I'm going to find you something in the Talmud to explain to you that the, the authors of the Talmud in fact said that when the final prophet comes, that when he does come, he's going to come having the ability or through God to abrogate the law. I have found this in the Torah. Okay. I have so, in the Talmud, sorry. Let's see. I have found it, but before I present it to you, because you said to me last time, from what I remember, that if I find you this evidence, that you will accept the evidence, and by implication, this means that you will accept the, the thing, the only one thing that was stopping you from recognizing the Prophet Muhammad as a final prophet was indeed this part, which is that he cannot abrogate the law and that the law should not be abrogated. So, on your understanding, if I am able to provide you evidence from the Talmud, which which says exactly what I've just said to you, you should accept my argument as at least one reading, which is legitimate within the scope of Jewish, Jew, Jewish law. Number if one. If you bring me evidence. Yes, I will. If you bring me evidence. Yes. Which is indisputable. Yes. Which is the way that we have classically understood this yes. piece of Talmud. Yes. Then fine. Then, I can then, then you accept it. Evidence. Okay, fine. remember that. Now, I will, before I go and proceed and present yeah, this evidence, I want to first challenge you one more time, last time, final time, on the issue of divine simplicity. Yes. My question to you is just one question, which is that how is it conceivable, intelligible on a rational level that something which is referred to in a certain language, let's say it's intelligence or knowledge, the knowledge of God, is the same as something which is understood in a completely different way. I want you to explain to me if, and you did accept this conditional, 
Knowledge is described, or all knowledge is described as the lack of ignorance. And that uh, power is described here is the lack of limitation. That how are you making these two things, which are clearly definitionally different from one another, one thing. How is it conceivable that these two things, which are definitionally understood differently, can be seen as the same thing? Because one, who, because one actually sub subsumes the other. This is what I was trying to get at before. Right? The limitlessness, the, the all-powerfulness, subsumes the lack of ignorance and the, and the all-knowledge. Right? What you've just... Yeah, sorry. One yeah. subsumes the other, so all-knowledge is simply subsumed into the category of all-power. All right. right, so... Lack of ignorance is subsumed by limitlessness. Okay, let me, let me come back to you. In fact, what you've just said there is incriminating. Why? is intellectually incriminating. Why? The reason why what you've just said there is not, nothing but intellectually incriminating is because to say something X is subsumed by Y is to, is to indicate the differentiation between X and Y. Meaning, if I say uh, the mother or the baby is contained within the mother's stomach, that is to distinguish between the baby and the mother. You cannot say something is subsumed by something else unless something else exists in the first place. So that's done. That's not actually necessarily no. True. That's done, Josh. No, it that's is, not it, true. It's, 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 it's an entailment. Not true. Yes, it is. Not true. No. And unless it's tautological. The only other way is that it's tautological. And if it's tautological, that means we're describing the same thing. If, do you know what a tautology is? Yes, a tautology is where you you say one thing and then you basically say it again but in slightly different language okay. in a way that um, yes. you're simply repeating yourself. So if you say that God's knowledge is the same as God's uh, power and you're saying they're the same thing, they're the different language, there's only one option for you if you're saying that they're not different, which is that they are tautological. That when God speaks about knowledge, he is speaking about uh, power, and when he is speaking about power, he's speaking about knowledge, which of course would corrupt the meaning, the corrupt not only the prima facie meaning, but any type of reading of the Hebrew Bible. Because if you understand it that way, that means when God's speaking about things which are applied to knowledge and then he references his knowledge that he's actually referencing his power and that and vice versa and so there is not even one master key category or one master key uh, uh, attribute which everything must be so-called some tube by because then one can argue what about the will of God the will of God is the will of God different or is it differentiated or is it similar or is it different to the power of God because the will and I think we agreed on this beforehand Will is the choice to do A over B or B over A. That's what will is. Uh, having choice and will means that you have an ability to choose A over B. You have the power to choose A over B. No problem. Yes. But if I say that he has the ability to choose A over B, that's referencing a different state of affairs to just saying that you have power. You can, it's conceivable, therefore, to have power without will. No, but it's not. not. You can't be all powerful and yet have power which is lacking. You, no, I didn't say all powerful. I, if you listen to what I just said, I said it's conceivable for something to have power but not will. Like I'll give you an example. This mobile phone right now. This mobile phone has power, would you agree? Everything I think you would agree. Yes. All right, so if this mobile phone has power, it has no will, it's not volitional, it cannot choose A over B, unless, of course, I decide for it. So in other words, the, 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 it has no decision-making ability. However, it has power. So it's conceivable that something can have power but no will. But it's not conceivable that something can have will but no ability. Unless, of course, sorry, we're talking about something which is uh, not, not in, the, in the realms of, uh, uh, of that which is conceivable. Yep. Will and no ability. So someone in a um, government state. Say again? So, someone in a vegetative... Yeah, vegetative, yeah. Not, not syndrome, sorry. Yeah. might have no will, but they have no ability to... Yeah, so in the vegetative, yeah. vegetative state, they, are, they have no will at that point, when they're in that state. No, but they have, there, is, there are the conditions where a person... Yeah, they have no will at that point. No, they do have will, but they have no way of... They can, they can sometimes move their toes and that's it. Okay, yeah. They don't have any power... If they can move it, then they've chosen to move it, which means they, they're not fully vegetated. Yeah. But do you, do you understand what I'm saying right now? I understand what you're saying. Two points to counter to the things that you said. Yeah. Number one, you said. Awesome, that's that, I'll go in reverse order. Um, the second thing that you said 
um, just now was that in, uh, was that the that the ability to choose is not the same. Uh, so, that, sorry, you said it's conceivable that one can have power without will, like the mobile phone, right? However, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about God. We're talking about all power, but we're talking about limitlessness, which means that there is all power, which includes the power of choice, the power of will, right? And back to the previous thing which you said, which was your raised an objection about tautology, and you said, well, then we'll have superfluous, superflu superfluous words in the Bible. Well, that, that, that's also not true, because no we have a dictum in Judaism called Torah Dib Rabbul Shalbani Adam. The Torah speaks in the okay. language of people. In order for people to understand what exactly we mean when we say God is limitless, we then need to give certain descriptions in order to understand what He is not. Okay. Right? We needed to understand okay. that there is no plurality, and therefore it uses the word echad, one. I appreciate We needed to understand that there, is, that, 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 that there is nothing beyond His knowledge, and therefore we had to use um, phrases like, um, uh, like, um, like um, uh, Hashem Yodea, Kol Machshav Eslibah, stuff like that. Hashem okay. knows all the, all the thoughts of the man's heart. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. It's teaching us lessons. I appreciate what you're saying, Josh. However, having said that, you have provided no defense for your position. Yes, I have. And, no, no, no problem. You have tried to de defend yourself. Let's let the people at home decide whether or not it's uh, satisfying or whether they're convinced. That's no problem. And of Let's... course, you're saying that because you have no, um, no, 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 no effective I... way of defending no, I... against that. Who's the, the burden of proof is upon the one that's making the claim. You're, you're, you're telling a claim. My claim is that when you're, when you're definitionally saying that something has no something is not ignorant and that's what knowledge is or it's all knowledge is that you're not ignorant and something has no limits and that's what uh, uh, power is something has the choice to do a over b that's what choice is you're effectively talking about three different state of affairs are do we do we say that god can make a choice a over b yes or no okay uh, do we say that god is uh, does not have ignorance Correct. Okay, so the, the, so the God knows things, yes? Correct. Okay, are we saying that God also is powerful in the sense that he has no limitations to his power from the things which are possible? Of course. Okay, now... Are what those I, first two things uh, powers? No, what I'm saying is, is my sentence A, B and C, did I say the same thing or did I say different things? B and C, sorry, A and B were, set, were, were different things okay, great. that are included within C. No problem. Included within it doesn't mean it's, it's, it means, by the way, it's distinct from it. But if you're saying, no. if, if, if it's, oh, fine, no problem. Sentence B and C, you said were different. No, was a, was a, my a, sentence B a, and C? Sorry, A and B. A, yeah. B. a was will, choice. Okay. B, you said, was knowledge. C, are they, you said, are they, was power. Are they same a or different? And B, a and B are separate things within C. How we defined A and B, you said they're separate to C, right? Correct. All right. So, in other words, if I were I mean, to... No, a and B are not separate to C. A and B are separate from each other, but Great. within no, C. Great. No problem. No problem. No problem. A and B are separate from each other. You heard it here first. No problem. You said it, yeah? Yes. Okay. So, that, that means to say that when I describe God's power, I described it in different terms yes. to the way that I described this choice. Correct? No, you... Will. No, you, when you described his knowledge, you described it in different terms than his choice. The will, no problem. Fine. So God's knowledge is different to God's will. Yes. Excellent. That's all I want you to say. You've just destroyed your own premise of no, divine... No, I have not. Yes, you have. I have not. And the reason I have not is because I have said that those two things, which from a human understanding are separate things, because okay. they are both examples of power. Okay. These are both descriptions no problem. of power. No problem. But they're separate. And God they're, is they're, essence, they're separate articulations of how we de describe the functionality of God, if you want to put it in that language. If there's two separate things, we are describing God using adjectives with different words. And these words have different meanings. You've just said yourself, B is different to C. So they are not tautological, which means that they're not describing the same thing. And if they're not tautological, you cannot say everything is this, uh, God has one attribute or, 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 or there's no attributes of God, that no attributes of God exist. That's impossible, it's a contradiction. You have to understand it's a contradiction. You can't say, say God's, can't say God's power. You can't say God's knowledge is X. God's choice is Y, yet God's knowledge and God's power, are, uh, uh, sorry, choice are the same. You can, that's a logical contradiction, impossible, Isn't there impossible, another, um, impossible. Aspects. If, we, if the Torah was worded in a way that there was no apparent tautology, a coherent doctrine that makes sense, it has to, ex I think it has to, ex it feels the need to explain. Um, 
features of God. He can't explain God's essence. He can't say what he is, but he can say that he can say that he's what he's not, maybe. No, no, but no, but what you what you're describing is what is referred to in systematic theology as negative attributes. So for example, if I were to use the example of pre-eternality uh, or post-eternality. I say God is not X. He doesn't have a beginning. God does not have a beginning, therefore he's pre-eternal. God does not have an end, therefore he's post-eternal. All right, so that's, that's a separate kettle of fish, if you like, a separate line of inquiry of describing God in positive terms. And when you're talking about God in choice, or the choice of God, or the, or the knowledge of God, we're not in, in, in describing God in, in negative terms, we're describing Him in positive terms. And so from that perspective, it's actually disanalogous. But let me just get, because this, well look, let's, let's get straight to the point, right? Already we've talked about divine supremacy. You said already that the Martesilis agree with this. There's a group of Islamists that are pretty much extinct now. We no agree problem. With the oh, you agree with the uh, Martesilis. But so, so far, you haven't, so, no, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Say, say you agree with the Martezilis. Yeah, yeah. So far, no problem. Become Muslim. I'm not going to say become Martezili. I'm not going to say that. But, but I mean... Well, you're being you know, disingenuous. No, no, no. I'm, I don't believe in what you said. Exactly. I, I've just refuted it. Anyway, look, no. having said that. Now, the second part of this discussion, where I think more pertinent. More pertinent here. Because you would agree with me, wouldn't you, Josh? Yes. That if God told us clearly in the Torah yeah. that this is how to describe me. Yes that these ways in which I'm uh, suggesting to you, for example, to do these attributes, would be something you would accept. If Moses said to you, God is all knowledgeable, that's different to the fact that he's all powerful. Would you accept it if Moses came to you and said that? If Moses came and said to me yes. that, that he's... The knowledge of God... knowledge is separate from power. Not fully separate, but in the sense that they are two, two, two different adjectives, yes. That they are two different adjectives yes. in language? Yes, yes. Or, that they are, or they are distinct from each other? These are two theory. separate attributes. God has attributes and he has an attribute of knowledge and he has the attribute of power. Would you if accept Moses it? Moses said it to me... Yeah, would you accept it? Not sure, maybe. Okay, okay. This, is, uh, this is disbelief, what you just said there. And you're, you're a heretic. Uh, no, honestly, how, if, if, if Moses himself, if, if, <laughs> it's the disbelief of Judaism to say that. If, if, if Moses said to you uh, X or Y, and you know, he says Moses, Moses, Moses. If you believe Wednesday is Thursday. Moses, sir, wait, wait, if, Moses, if Moses is speaking, <laughs> yeah. it's different between Moses speaking on his own behalf and Moses speaking as a No, he's, he's, saying he's saying it's from God. From Let's God. say he's saying it's from God. I'm saying he's saying it's from God. What, you would that's reject? Like, that's like saying, well, if, if, if Moses comes to you and says that Wednesday is Thursday, should you believe him? It's nonsense, because Moses would not say something. No, but what you've, no, what you've said, what you've said is the equivalent of Wednesday equals Thursday. No, I don't, exactly look, what you've said. No, You're I, saying, look, if look, Moses comes let people, and says let people something, people which decide. is contradictory to what he said before, well then, should you listen to him now? Okay, see, this is, this, this is the disbelieving uh, way which the Quran actually uh, attacks about Jewish clergy. Actually, to be honest with you. Allah. You, you, why'd you kill the prophets of God? Why'd you, uh, you know, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? You still have the same remnants of the old uh, clergy, a Jewish clergy who disbelieve, disbelieving notions. Anyway, now let's let's see how sincere you are. These because polemics, you, let me, no, 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 honestly, they, 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 the they says, mean nothing to us. It doesn't they matter. They mean nothing to us. They will on the day of judgment. Let's see it. No, honestly, they will. Uh, what Rabbi Joseph Albo? You know him? Yeah, the Sefer Ikrim. You know him? The Sefer Ikrim. Okay, listen to what Rabbi Joseph Albo. You're gonna read it in context or out of context? Because I've, I've heard. Uh, it. Look, look, please, please. Yeah. Please. Okay. Fine. Please. If you think that something I'm going to read is out of context, it's upon you to provide how I've decontextualized or otherwise distorted the notion. But, but with, let me, with, but, but with let me finish. With the pre-agreement, with the pre-agreement yeah. before you read it, yeah. that I'm not a walking encyclopedia. No problem. And I do not have a smartphone. Well, After you've read it, are we able to go on can, Safari and look at the context ab itself? Absolutely, we can do phone. whatever you like. Great. Well, on his phone, on my phone, on anybody's phone. So he said to us, ladies and gentlemen, before, that if you find me something in the Talmud that indicates to the fact that a prophet can come after Moses and that he will be given the right to abrogate the law, that he will accept it. Now I'm going to read something to you from his authority. Jo Joseph Albo wrote, According, accordingly, if his mission is proved in the same manner as uh, as was that of Moses, talking about the prophet, the new prophet that come after Moses, listen carefully. It is proper to listen to the second prophet, even if he desires to abolish the precepts of the first. Abolish, abolish. And it's mentioned in Safar. 
Halak Krim, volume 3, chapter 19, verse number 6. So Please now respond. Let's look in the context. Now, two things. Number yeah, one, we need yeah. to look at the context. Yeah, we will, yeah. Right? I, I, and, and when we do, and if it turns out what I say is true, will you be willing now to accept the truth of Islam? Sure, because I know I know the context. <laughs> I know the context, and I know you've taken it out of context. Okay. I know you've taken it out of context. See, look. I've read this before. I've read this before. I know you've taken it out of context. Okay. You're gonna be right? very I know you have. This video it goes all around I know, the I world. Know. I know. And <laughs> long live scientists and scientists. Uh, right. you know. Number two, you're mistaken. Oh, what's, what's the thing is not Sorry, the Talmud. What's, what's the but regardless, again? so look on Safaria. S E F A R I A. Is it dot com? I don't know if it's dot com. It's Safaria and. Oh, it's Safaria. That's right, yeah. Right, it's got a plethora of Jewish texts on it. Safari, that's the name, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, by the way, it's not working, I don't, is this it? S -E Just type in Safaria. Um, yeah, okay. That, it's .org, there you go. Okay. Right. Oh, it's .org, yeah. Yeah. Got all the Jewish texts. Well, Safaria yeah, comes from, uh, so, the word so Safer, which means Safer means a scrolls, book. right? Yeah, Safer means a book. So, if we click on... Probably scrolls book, same scrolls. thing, brother, man. Don't, 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 be too, uh, don't, don't be too harsh on me, huh? The scrolls. I will be very harsh. Because <laughs> you're taking Safer Ikim out of context, and I don't appreciate it. Okay, um, well, let's take a look at it, okay, brother. So because maybe the, it's uh, you that wants to take it out of context. Right, so, so it was, uh, was it volume three, did you say? Let me take a look. Okay. Uh, volume three, yes. Chapter 19, verse six. Okay. Of course. Right, so volume three is minus three. Chapter 19. 19. Verse six. Yeah, I'm sure John. Okay, number six. Paragraph six. There's no verses, it's paragraphs. But that's fine. Okay, so let's... Let's read this. Hold on. Derech Haberu Hazer. It's actually got English in. The manner in which one can have this later. Yeah, just read that. Having yeah. absolute verification of the general character of the second divine messenger. This proof cannot consist. No, 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 sorry, you're not reading it properly. Okay. Just read it. The manner in which one can have this later certainty is by having an absolute verification of the genuine character of the second divine messenger. This proof cannot consist in the performance of miracles, since we see many other persons who are not prophets performing miracles, either by creating an illusion or by magic, yeah. like the Egyptian magicians, yeah. or through some other art. Yeah. Moreover, we find that those prophets who are not sent to announce a law also perform miracles, hence we cannot tell whether the miracle performed by the person in question shows that he has been sent to promulgate a law or whether it merely indicates that he is a prophet. It is clear therefore that a miracle is no proof that the messenger is genuine okay. as was explained in the 18th chapter of the first book but the proof must be derived from the law of Moses for the reason given in the 11th chapter of the first book. Accordingly, if his mission is proved in the same manner as was that of Moses it is proven to listen to the second prophet even if he desires to abolish the precepts of the first. Ah, ah, ah. This is the reason why the Israelites believed the word of Moses even ah. though some of his precepts were opposed to the Noachian law ah. as we said before but which they knew by tradition as divine. But they were absolutely convinced that God desired to promulgate a law through Moses, else they would not have had the right to budge from their tradition, from the law which came down to them by an unbroken tradition from their ancestors, going back ultimately to Adam and Noah. So how this is conviction this? was reached in two ways. Yes. They felt certain that, he, that, that the last prophet, who was introducing changes, was greater, than, was greater than the first, and they verified the genuineness of the last prophet's mission as firmly as that of the first. Both these kinds of proof applied absolutely Moses' case. Yes. He was a greater prophet than those who lived before him. Yes. He performed wonderful miracles such as had never been performed before. Yes. Yes. The Bible makes it clear when it says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, as God Almighty, but my name, God, I made me not known to them. The meaning is that God revealed himself to Moses with his great name, by means of which he were able, was able to perform miracles openly and publicly, changing the laws of nature, such as had never been done for the earlier prophets, who could only perform invisible miracles to deliver them death from in time of famine and from the sword in time of war. The mission of Moses was verified because all Israel heard the voice speaking to Moses, as the Bible says, that the people may hear when I speak with thee. For I desire to promulgate a law through thee, and this will be or make them believe what thou sayest. For this reason, Israel was obliged to believe his words, even though he were to abolish all that was said by the prophets before him. Since his mission was verified, as he explained in the 18th chapter of the first book, and his prophetic grade was superior to all the rest, as explained in chapter 10 of this book. John Moore. Whether in the future there may come another prophet who will abolish the words of Moses and whom we shall be obliged to believe, this can happen only, as we have said, in one of two ways. Either the new prophet will be proved to be greater than Moses 
or his mission will be verified as that of Moses. Now the Bible says that there cannot be a prophet greater than Moses. If there, if there be a prophet among you, I the Lord do make myself known unto him in a vision. My servant Moses is not so, he is trusted in all my house. With him do I speak mouth to mouth. It seems then that Moses' prophecy is superior to any other. And at the end of the Torah we read that there will never arise another prophet like Moses whom God knew face to face. This is the degree which Moses asked for and was granted to him as we read at the end of the Torah. And there hath not arisen a prophet since, since in Israel like unto Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. Therefore, if any prophet or anyone professing to be a prophet should come and say that he has attained a higher grade than Moses, which is impossible, and should say that we should listen to him and abolish any of the commands of Moses, not as a temporary measure merely, we will refuse to listen to him, but will tell him that he must prove his superiority to Moses and all the prophets who came after him and were his disciples by performing miracles greater and more wonderful than those performed by Moses and all the other prophets by humiliating him, uh, by humiliating all those who dispute with him, as Moses did to Koh, by humiliating all those who dispute with him, as Moses did to Koh and his assembly, by triumphing over and overcoming all the wise men of his age and all his opponents, as Moses did to Pharaoh and to all the magicians and wise men of Egypt, by performing miracles in public and in the presence of all the people, as Moses did in the presence of Pharaoh and all Israel, and by maintaining the miracles a long time, as Moses caused to go before the people a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and caused the manna to come down for forty years without ceasing, except on the Sabbath day when it did not come down, in order to show the sanctity of the Sabbath and the truth of his words, and by fulfilling <laughs> and by fulfilling many other conditions of this kind, without which he cannot make good his claim. The reason the Israelites that's obeyed that's Jeremiah. That's that. more. That's that. Now we're going to a different topic. Otherwise, it's, 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 it's not. more. It's more. All right, fine. Yeah, it carries on. It carries on. Fine. Right. The reason the Israelites obeyed Jeremiah and abolished counting the months from Nisan, as we have seen, is perhaps, is perhaps because they based their action upon the interpretation of biblical verse, as we find in the toast from the first chapter to Chetis Megillah, that the reason Ezra changed the written characters when he returned from the exile was because of his interpretation of biblical verse. Okay, so he is going on a different topic. Okay, good, right? good, good. So what okay. you see here is yes, yes. he would have to prove that he is greater than Moses. He would have to be able to show that his miracles are greater than that of Moses. Okay. Right? Moses was proven as a true prophet because everybody heard. Okay. Ev the entire nation heard God speaking to Moses. All right, Josh. That did not happen with Muhammad. Thank you very much. There you Thank go. Thank you very much. Now, are you saying to me, because you've already retracted your position once, you're saying... One part of the position, yeah. Yeah, no problem. But you're saying to me now, because what you were saying before was that it was inconceivable that a prophet can abrogate that which came before. Are you saying now that it's conceivable? There is an exception to the rule. Ha <laughs> ha. The exception to the rule is, the exception, you can laugh all you like, but the exception of the rule does not apply to your false prophet. Okay. Because the okay. exception to the rule, the exception to the rule is where th we th have the miracles which are, which are, which are, you see. Which, which are on, on, or which are greater than the caliber of Moses. Josh, Josh, and, don't be rude, and yeah? And we have to hear. Don't be rude. And we have to hear. Josh, don't be rude. Don't, no don't, be, no, don't, don't say false prophet. We're having a good discussion. Fine. Don't be rude. Yeah. Then Muhammad. Yeah, right? okay, fine. We, right? Yeah, and don't be rude. Then, then we... Yeah. I've lost my chain of thought. Right, the, the, yeah. the, the exception is... The exception is, right, it needs to be like Moses. In when okay. Moses, we heard the okay. words that God spoke to Moses. Right, but Josh, the entire people heard, Josh, nobody heard, no one heard the words okay. of God Josh, speaking to Muhammad. Josh, yes. in our previous encounters, yes. you said that a new prophet who introduces abrogation yes. is, is disqualified from being a prophet by virtue of the fact that he's introduced abrogation. Now, what, I'm, what we've just read here from Joseph Albo is, in fact, not only was it conceive, what is it conceivable in the future that whatever prophet that could conceivably show that is greater than Moses could do so, but that Moses himself abrogated the law from Noah and those who came before him. So you are wrong on two accounts. Now, you have to admit this before we go forward. You are wrong on two accounts. You are wrong when you said that was impossible for a prophet that comes after Moses to introduce abrogation. You are wrong. According to Talmud, that's wrong. It's not the Talmud, by the way, but carry on. Okay, well, according to this, the, the person that Safe you consider the, the Sefer of Ikram, yeah? You, you, you are wrong on that. And now, would you accept that you're wrong on that? Sure, I should have made, okay, it, I should have made great. it more clear with exceptions. You're no right. problem. I admire your sincerity here, and I admire your humi intellectual humility here. So you're wrong there. You're wrong again when you indicated that that had never happened in the past because we had a long discussion in this very corner where you were trying to establish beyond 
and it was implausible deniability in my opinion. You are trying to establish that none, no abrogation ever existed in, in Jewish history basically or before it with any of the prophets. That was wrong as well according to this, correct? That is true. So you are wrong on that account and you are wrong on this account. So already we are seeing that you are wrong on major issues here. What was the abrogation, what was the abrogation that has happened? The abrogation that has happened, as he says, Joseph Albo, he says that actually Moses abrogated the teachings of the prophets that came before. We just read it out. No, we just. Saying, I thought you said after Moses. No, I said both. I said that Joseph Albo stated that it was abrogated in the past. So Moses abrogated that which came before him and that it can conceivably be abrogated in the future. So long as the prophet indicate or shows or proves that he is greater than Moses. That's exactly what we've just read. So it's conceivable on both counts. We've just read it in context. We've just had a 10 minute reading session. We just read it. No one can say we decontextualized it. So now you've changed the goalposts again, Josh, because what you've said is now we need evidence to show that the prophet was greater than Moses. The source but actually, but no, I'm sorry, but actually what we actually read, if we're being very specific and I was clear to be specific on this matter, I was making sure that I was, my comprehension skills were sharp and I had to make sure that I was on point. Ah. Do you know, I read that he said, in fact, that the prophet himself cannot claim to be greater than Moses. Now, I will tell you today that the prophet actually never claimed to be greater than Moses, ever. And in fact, when there's a time where someone came to him stating that Yunus Jonah was greater than him and the prophet corrected him and said, don't say that such and such a prophet is greater than me. Out of the humility of the prophet, out of the humility of the prophet Muhammad, he doesn't claim that he's greater than that. He doesn't, he's never actually made that self praise claim. So even on that count, it doesn't actually work. So right now you are in a situation where you have to decide whether the Prophet Muhammad, on the virtue of his own miracles, which is what he, this man told us, Joseph Albo, this sage, he, he's telling us that on the virtue of, of the actual claim, he said miracles are not good enough because a magician can make a miracle. Ibn Taymiyyah made the same argument in his book, Al-Nubu'at, by the way. He says, but actually miracles are not good enough as a way to prove prophethood. That's Deuteronomy 13, that's where he's getting it. No problem. Uh, uh, no, no. Joseph Alpha lived a long time after Muhammad. No, no problem. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not saying Muhammad that's said it. That's a very good point. I'm not saying Muhammad said this. I'm saying that this point of that you, uh, miracles are not good enough is something which we accept. But now we have to do some soul searching. I'm saying that on the balance of evidence, the same reasons why you would look at Moses and say, you know what, he's a prophet. Whatever reasons that you think you have, we have greater reasons to show that Muhammad is a prophet. That's my challenge to you. Now I want, this is, this is where the conversation is now. In the 21st century, me standing here in central London, in speaker's corner with this young, strapping Jewish man. I'm talking about him, by the way. No, I'm joking. <laughs> my question is, my question is, if I were to make an argument from the Prophet, the truth of the Prophet Muhammad, would you be able to, on logical grounds alone, make an argument greater than the argument I can make for, the, for Moses? Do you think you can? The, 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 I think you make an argument for Muhammad, and then I would have to yeah. try to make an argument greater no, for Moses. No, I'm saying, is, can you make a claim that the evidence of the truthfulness of Moses. A, actually, A, the existence of Moses. I believe in the existence of Moses. But the existence of Moses itself, that itself is more historically tenuous than the existence of Muhammad, just by virtue of the fact that he came way before. Everything aside and in addition to that, any argument that you can make for the truthfulness of the Prophet Moses, I am challenging you and saying I can make a greater argument for, for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You, okay, go ahead. What is your, what evidence, you, if someone were atheist came to you, somebody came to you and said, look, what evidence do you have that Moses was a true prophet? What would you respond? The claim of mass national revelation. The claim of mass national revelation goes as follows. That there is currently a people that exists 
today, in the 21st century, that unanimously, that unanimously believe, unanimously hold a tradition that 3,334 years ago, that's 3,334 years ago. Sorry, sorry. I, I was just a bit. I, I noticed. No, no, I'm so sorry. Say it again. The claim of mass national revelation, yes. which is as follows. There is currently, and this is a fact, there is currently a people who lives in this world in 2022 that in unanimity believes with total faith that 3,334 years ago their ancestors heard the words of God at a mountain and Moses was their leader at this time. Now, why is there a nation that believes such a thing? The reason we believe such a thing is because our fathers told us this fact and their fathers told them this fact and their fathers told them this fact and this goes back all the way to the event itself. Well, you'll ask me, well, how do you know this was not concocted at some later date and somebody said, well, maybe this ha and somebody came up to a group of people and said, well, many years ago, many years ago, somebody Oh, wow. um, um, that many years ago there many years ago there was uh, th there was an event at a mountain um, from your ancestors and then some sort of earth shattering event happened um, or something less than an earth shattering event happened which caused all of them all, every one of your ancestors to forget that this had ever happened and here I am now Fred and I'm telling you this indeed took place Right. If you want to say maybe such a such a, such an event happened to concoct this fairy tale, then I would answer you. If such an event occurred to concoct it, if Fred came along, we would have his name. We would know about this event in which a people were told your ancestors heard this a long ago, but you all forgot all about it and you know nothing about this. Right. We, we, we would know all about it. We have no such event mentioned in our history. We have no such person. And this coming from a people, this coming from a people who have names for everyone of significance in our people's history. We have names of every rabbi who made a contribution to the Talmud. We have names of every rabbi who made a contribution to the Mishnah, Brises, Tosefta, and Midrashim. We have names of numerous, right? We're talking about tens, tens of different prophets that made contributions to the to the fate of the Jewish people during the first temple period and during the Babylonian and Persian exiles. Yes. We have names of all of the seventy elders. Yes. That that um, yes. that were the students. So of the Moses so the argument, Joshua. just so I can get it right, your your argument is effectively an argument for preservation of the faith that the faith has been preserved and that we know that this has been said by Moses and that the initial primary audience which were the children of Israel heard it and that the evidence that the truthfulness of Judaism is predicated on these facts. There is one point that you missed out Go ahead, please. and that is the point that they heard the words directly from God himself okay. and not from a person. Okay, excellent, no problem. That they heard it from God himself, no yes. problem. Excellent, 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 excellent. The first thing he said to, do you know what's really interesting is, the first thing he said was that, you know, our forefathers said, etc. The Quran actually has a verse on this. That if it said to them, believe in what Allah has revealed, they say, no, we follow what our forefathers believe in. Even if their forefathers didn't have any knowledge. Now, the, the point is, that first of all, at best what you're doing to me, with me right now, is showing me of a, a necessary condition for why Judaism is true. You're not giving me any reason to, to show, and it's not a necessary condition, sorry, it's not a sufficient condition. Let me explain why. The preservation of a religion is a must for the religion to be true. It's not enough for the religion to be true. It's not enough. Just because uh, some people 
uh, because really you can make this argument with false religions. You can actually make this argument with Magianism. You can make this argument with Zoroastrianism. You can actually make this argument with many other religions. That there were some people in the primary audience that actually uh, heard this. And you can even, to be honest, you make can even, sorry, you can, you can make, make a better argument. And I say this with all certainty. Yeah. You can make a better argument for Christianity. You can. Make it then. Let's hear Okay, it. Let's the hear argument it. that a Christian will say. Yes. And by the way, I don't need to make arguments for Christianity because I'm a Muslim. I'm, I have to tell, I tell you. I have to tell him. I have to tell the people. Make but, it, make it. No, no, no. No, but I'm just, I'll make it. But just, I'm just giving you the point first. Okay. Right. The, 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 the difference is, and here's, here's what I will say. Your religion, okay, Judaism, that has no chain of narration for 1,300 years. We've said this and we've established this before. The difference between my religion has none for 200. No, no, hold on. I've looked on That's false. Website. That's false. I've looked. No, no, your website is so wrong. Of narration. Please no, stop. This is your website. Let me this stop. Is your stop. Website let me finish. Let me, I'll let you spoke. I'll let you speak. You spoke for some time, right? Yeah. Did I interrupt you? No, I didn't. Do you have a chain of narration from the any 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 scroll that you like, whether it's the Maserati text or it's the Dead Sea Scrolls or any other scroll that you like? Have you got a chain of narration? From that scroll, or the authors of that scroll, whoever by the way they may be, because we don't know who they are, all the way to Moses, no you don't. The answer is no you don't. It's a dead history, no historian on the first uh, face of the earth will tell you, my friend, look, sorry to say, your, ha your Haggadic texts, your Agadic texts, your tafsir, your exegesis of your, uh, of your Old Testament, they, sorry, you call it the Hebrew Bible, that was written three to four hundred years after Jesus himself. Jesus, Jesus, not Moses. We're talking about three, four hundred years, according to news. Now, I told you this before, you didn't know his name, then you went and found out, which is one of the most prolific Jewish uh, scholars. Thank you, but Jewish. No problem. He wrote 900 books. He's one of the most uh, printed pe people in the world. Actually, he, I think he holds the record for the most books ever written. Joseph Neusner. Oh, Jacob, sorry, Jacob Neusner. So anyway, according to him, it's three to four, the tafsir, the exegesis that you have of your Hebrew Bible that we can now find, we can access it. It's been written 400 years after Jesus. You do not have a chain. You are lying if you say you have a chain of narration. You are lying if you say, hold on, if you have a chain of narration from Moses to that. Number one. Number two is, oh, no, you don't. Now you've, you made a claim about Islam. You said it was a 200, 300 years. That's absolutely false. Absol well, we're talking nonsense because number one, the chain of narration goes back to the Sahaba, the companions, the ones who were there with the Prophet. Mm -hmm. Some of them actually wrote stuff. Abu Bakr Siddiq had a Sahifa, a Sahifa. Amr ibn Az had a Sahifa, which means something written like uh, Sefer, you know, Sefer, Sahifa, quite similar. So, uh, Suhuf and Safar are the same, by the way, Hebrew and Arabic are very similar languages. Yeah, Safar means what? It means a book or a scroll. And Sahifa means scroll as well. So, so that's why I know these things. But what I'm saying is, these, these things were absorbed. I mean, you mentioned two, three hundred years. When did Abu, uh, when did Abu Shahab al-Zuhri die? Abu, Abu Shahab al-Zuhri, he, he died in the hundred, like 120, 140, something like that. Yeah? A-H. Is that right? Yeah? 120 A-H. 120 A-H, he died. That's 110 years after the Prophet Muhammad died. 110 years. And that was a state effort to codify the Hadith, a state effort. So you're saying two to three hundred years is actually a historical, even from the codification, what you call Tadween Sunnah. But Tadween Sunnah or the codification of the Sunnah is not the same as the, it's not it's the same as Riwayat al Hadith, which was there from the time of the Sahaba. So you're confusing two things. And by the way, that's rich coming from someone who believes in the oral tradition. You didn't have a written book for a thousand four hundred years. And you're talking to me about, oh, it's two or three hundred years after the Prophet Muhammad. You didn't have one single scroll, my friend. Uh, for a thousand years, at least our scrolls were there. We had uh, Suhuf of the Sahaba. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Uktub li Abi, Ibn Abi Shah. You know, he said to the Sahaba themselves, write it down. Says, we have it in our tradition. And then we have it all the way through to the state effort of Ibn Shah al-Zuhri, who died at 120, was there a, a tabai, basically. It was a salaf. It was tabai. There was a state effort to write. And then after him, you have the Muatta and Bukhari and this thing. We're well, talking about two, three hundred years. That's what you're talking about. Who Bukhari died like 234 or something like that. And uh, Ahmad died 241 or something like that. Yeah? That's what you're talking about. You're not talking about even... A, so you're wrong. You're wrong. You are wrong. Yeah? Don't make uh, claims about Islam which you have no sources for. And that you, you, you basically... Don't, but if this is an argument, what I'm saying is, Mimbebi Aula, as we say in Arabic, if this is an argument that your whole argument for why Moses is true and your codification 
and uh, it, it was there a thousand four hundred years after, thousand five at least, uh, at least a thousand five hundred years Moses. And number two, that uh, most of it was oral, actually, yeah. And there's no, like, uh, and the codification, and, and also, yeah. If this is your argument, then that which we have is so much superior by historical necessity than what which you have. As that's why I said to you before, whatever evidence you provide to me today for Moses, I will provide for you a better evidence for Muhammad. If your evidence is entirely, most of your strongest evidence you provide to Moses is the preservation of the religion. No, mass revelation. Mass revelation. Tawatur, we have it as well. Mass yeah. revelation. Yes, well, you, well, you say I don't. We, uh, that's Name exact one person besides Muhammad who heard God talking to Muhammad. Moses. Moses heard Moses. God speaking to Muhammad. No, so, no, Moses speaking to God. But no, no, but here's, here's what we'll say. Yeah, one, no, one but the person thing is, who heard God speaking to Muhammad. That's a, that's a, fa Muhammad. I, that's a false criterion. Well, we, that's what no, I no, no. it was. No, no, that's no, the whole point. No, it doesn't matter. Your criterion it is flawed. Matter. No, no, hold on. Because your criterion is based on the premise that there should be other people that listen to the revelation of God. What we do have instead, and we have uh, narrations for it, is the physical effect of how the Prophet Muhammad when he would receive revelation, how that would have an effect of him, which would be physically uh, unintelligible in the situation that he's in. For example, that we have a hadith of Aisha radiallahu an, anha, who said, she said that when the Prophet was on the camel, that when the revelation came to him, the camel would sink. Number two, it's even mentioned that when the Prophet would receive revelation, that he would sweat heavily profusely on a cold day. Fiyoman buried on a cold day. Number three, it's mentioned that when he would have revelation, that there would be jealous, like a loud uh, uh, ringing noise. These things are something other people have uh, witnessed. Number four, sometimes we believe that the revelation comes through a man, that uh, J uh, Jibreel alayhi salam, alayhi salam, comes as a man. And that man was witnessed by other companions, like in the famous hadith of Umar ibn Khattab, where he says that uh, the man came shadid bayad al thawb shid sawad al thiyab and so on. Yeah, and so uh, this man came and everyone witnessed him. Uh, and there are other evidences beside that point. The point is, is that he didn't. Not, he was not the only one who saw the physical effects of. He was not the only one who saw the physical effects of revelation. He was not the only one who saw the physical effect of revelation. And we can make the same argument with miracles of the Prophet Muhammad sallam. That the things that happened with him where the water came from his uh, finger sallallahu alaihi wasallam or even in shikhaq al-kamar or the splitting of the moon all of these things were witnessed by the sahaba or for instance by the companions of the prophet the primary audience or for example the fact we mentioned this already which is a prophecy which is still there nowadays that the romans had beaten the persians and so on that's in the quran and that they they had been defeated in the first place and that goes back to 1821 the prophecy and there's a range of different prophecies which we can verify until this day. And the other physical uh, 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 miracles of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, many of which were witnessed, for example, small food turning into many different food. Uh, a lot of Sahaba, we have tawatur on these issues, uh, 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 which means that mass transmission. If, if, your, if your criterion is that something which is otherwise supernatural, otherwise supernatural, like for example, I'll give you Salah Surah al Jash was a Sahabi who tried to attack, or actually at that time he wasn't, but he was try, tried to attack the Prophet Muhammad and kill him. And then his, his uh, camel sunk into the, uh, into, the, into the sand when he tried to attack him. Things like the fact that the winds came. This time in Ahzab, the wind you got in your hand. I've, I can keep going on, 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 on. No, I'm just keeping track of the points. Too. Yeah. You, you These point, points. No, no. But, but the, the point I'm making is that if your argument is hinged on the fact that something supernatural happened to Moses, which was witnessed by a community, and that you have a mass transmission of that thing which is supernatural up until this time, which is seen with, a, with, a, with an unbroken chain, then what we have in more miracles which have been witnessed with a better chain of narration, which is historically verified and that there has been critical methods applied to that called Jarha Ta'deel or Alm Rijal, what we have is more superior to you on two fronts. The frequency of miracles and, number two, and frequency and quantity yeah, and the amount of people who know their names, the exact names and biographies, when they lived, where they died, and what geographic region they lived, and the fact that it's actually we have a better chain of narration. And by the way, most of the chains of narration are rejected, which means there's a critical method, what you call naqd, naqd, which is applied to that. What we have is better than what you have. 
And you, not, with all due respect, if you deny that, you're not doing so out of intellectual argumentation. Actually, so because of the forefather point. You have a tribe, you have a religion, and you must be with them. Because there's, if this is your argument for why Moses is true, then wallahi, uqsumu billahi al-azim, wallahi, may Allah curse me and destroy me in this place. If the argument I have provided to you right now is not better, wallahi it is. Right. So you've made eight points there that I could that I could remember uh, that I was counting along. So number one, you spoke about number one, you spoke about our chain of narration, and you said it's uh, it's really not very good at all. And there's a thousand three hundred years, you're saying a thousand four hundred years without any stuff. And you quoted this Neuberth figure, whoever he is, um, the, the, I forget his name, Jacob. What's his Neustar. name? Him, no, 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 um, who I did some research on, and he's. Uh, and he's a secularist, so so, so it's not as if that, genetic uh, fallacy. So it's, it's not as if sorry. That's the genetic fallacy. It doesn't it, matter if he was a Jew not, or a Muslim or no, Christian. No, if he's making no, points, no, he's making points. No, 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 but no, because because he rejects certain things out of hand as a premise. Right? No problem. He's a Bible critic like the rest of them, okay. who has certain premises that he will not state. Right? Okay. The premise of Bible critics has always been miracles are not true, God is not real. And the Bible is therefore not divine. And therefore, based on that, let's now see what, come, what we come out of all of this stuff. Right? That Proceed was to the point. That premise of all of the Bible. Okay, critics. that's irrelevant. So that's number. That, 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 that's 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 first of all. Secondly, when you speak about about your chain of narration. Yes. Right. The last time we spoke about the chain of narration, right, in part one. Um, you talked about how they've got all this biographical information about each person on the chain. So I did a bit of research and I found the Isnad website. It's collected the, uh, what's it called, Rajal or something? Rijal. The, yeah, sorry? Rijal. Rijal, that's the one. Um, of all the... Of, Just of all means the meant. Yeah, of all the different, the different people in this thing. And they have the different, um, the different um, titles, right? They've got um, the one that means valiant, begins with a T. Um, for the people who are very good, what's it called, Tahi or Tahik? What's it called? I don't know what you're saying. The, it's, yeah. it's got like a, it's yeah. got like a word, an adjective next to people to say whether or not they're very, very good. Right? It means valiant. Ta tahik, Taki. Dive. That's the one. Ta Dive is weak. No. So not Dive means weak. Yeah. It begins with a T. It was uh, very thicker. good. Thicker. That was a uh, thicker. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. I knew you knew what I was talking. about. No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> um, and. And if you click on one of them, it's, very, it's a very useful tool on the internet, very useful amount of information, and you can see it's got all the biographical information, right? The, ma the majority of these take up about, about a quarter of a page, right, in Arabic. I take them onto Google Translate, find out what they mean, and I look to see what kind of information we have on these various people with the, uh, with the thicker label. Right? So there's some people who I was impressed by, right? They've got dates, they've got places, occupation, like what you said. But that's maybe, 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 maybe 10, 15 of them I could find that. Way. Looking through the, uh, the, the, the vast majority of the people who had this label, I discovered something where in fact most, most of them do not have dates, many of them do not have places, most of them doesn't tell you anything about their life, anything about their occupation. In fact, you know very little about most of these people. And it seems to me that the people earlier in the chain and the people much later in the chain are the people you have the most information about. And everyone in between seems to be in this big gap. So I think, no I think, I, about I think, I think, you made lots of points. Okay. I'm going through now. And All right. Take your time. Because you're only one digging the hole deeper one, for me to, one by one. <laughs> to criticize you. One by one. Because, Take your time. Because otherwise I'll forget the different points you made. Because you do go on a lot. Um, I think you do this with Bob as well. Number, number three you talked about. Let's see if I can remember. Number three you spoke about. You spoke about. Uh, you know what? I'll go to miracles. I'll go to miracles. You spoke about miracles with Muhammad. Well, again, you already admitted. You don't believe that miracles are a criteria anyway. Right? You don't believe no, that. I didn't say, I didn't say that. You, you spoke about how Muhammad's miracles are so amazing and, and people. I just said it didn't say me, I said that. That, 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 um, that, that people could that the people could see the effects of the miracles. I said that, that it didn't say me, I said fingers and the, the No, no, you said, you said that I said that they were not a criterion. I said that Ibn Taymiyyah said that they're not the only criterion because a magician can be can do things which are... Well, I'm 
not saying that that's not what I said, so that's just something to say. So, yeah. so a magician could make the water come out of his fingers, and, yeah, yeah. and, yeah. and in fact, from our own sources, from the Sifri, um, it, in, in the Sifri, it actually says that somebody who claims to have split the moon is an idolater, right? Mm. That was that's something that it says in the Sifri. Yeah, right? it says that after Prophet Muhammad, by the way. No, the Sifri yeah, yeah. was long before Muhammad. Yeah, yeah. Sifri, that's what you think. The Sifri was long before Muhammad. There were two collections of Sifri, one was from the school of Shimon ben Yochai, yeah. and the other was from the school of Yishmoel. Yeah, I know. Both okay. of whom lived many, many years before Muhammad, okay. and both of whom schooled when, when was it, was when, 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 many, when, many Sifri was written maybe the, the, the 3rd century don't, don't, CE, don't, the 4th century CE. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Oh, okay, we'll Absolutely come to that. It no, it wasn't. Right? And, and in fact, they are cross shepherds okay. by other... Oh, get, me a, get me a source uh, for that, because that's, that's false. Keep going. Um, no, when, uh, when, when, when even, Yossi even the told I wasn't mentioned uh, written three years, the 3rd century CE, bro. I have the sources, not off yeah. the top of my head. I'm not, as I say, I'm not a lot of things. Okay, okay fine. Go ahead. But I can, I, I can text you the sources, because I, I have a number. Go ahead. Um, the the issue of um, the issue of prophecy is oh the, 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 the Romans would be defeated by this one. We, we, we also have that stuff in the Book of Daniel, right? We have such prophecies no about, uh, about that. Well, stuff. Some so, of the Book of Daniel might be true. So, 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 so that also doesn't. Um, so what? So what? Especially, well, what since, especially since in Deuteronomy 13, yeah. in Deuteronomy 13, it says that even if it comes true, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's a true prophet. So that's also okay. not working. A very important point that you seem to have missed, and I was really hoping you would elaborate on the point you said at the beginning, which was about Christianity. You wanted to say, you wanted to say yeah. that you could make a much more convincing argument for Christianity than you yeah. could for Judaism. Okay. Put and that then, to the wait, side. Hold, no, I'm not putting it to the side because it's very important. Yes, it's exactly showing what my point was to yes, begin with, and you don't seem to have understood it, which is the issue of mass revelation is central to this claim, okay. right? Rev right? A revelation in which an entire people heard words at the same time from God himself, All right. right? Josh. Something that no other religion has. And if you go to Christianity and you say, well, they saw miracles, they saw a man, just like with Muhammad, they saw from a man. No, none of these, none of these things were anything more than just a man. All you saw was a man. Right. We did not see a man. Okay. In fact, we did not see did anything. Did you see anything? This is in Deuteronomy. The people. Did you see it? I'm 22 years old. I wasn't there 3,334 years ago. All right, so you didn't see it. No, I personally did not see it. Right. Right? The, as, as it says in Deuteronomy. So when you say we, you're talking you, about some guys 3,000 years my ago. My ancestors. Okay. Right? You did not see an image, you heard voices. Right? There was a fire, and you heard the voice of God from heaven. That's what they heard. And they passed that down to their children, who passed down to their children. Okay, okay. There was no way for that to be faked. If you yes, can, there say, many ways to be if faked. can show a way that, this could, that, that could be yeah, faked, yeah. then we can All have right, that. Okay, no problem. Uh, let's start with the first thing that you mentioned, which is you, you mentioned some false things about this Isnad, yeah? Right. You said that you went on a website, and then you saw some names, and then you put it on Google Translate. This is exactly what you said. Yes. And then you, went, you researched the names, and some of them you could find dates, and others you couldn't. This is the argument from ignorance. Just because you couldn't find anything, it doesn't mean it's not there. I mean, so, you, so wait, hold on. Can you, can you give me Just, a, no, after the discussion, come, come, can you text come. the names of the books so I can find yes, out? Yes, uh, yeah. Sierra Alam al Go to Sierra Alam, Sierra Alam al Nubala. Al Dhahab wrote a book with all the details of each and every. Uh, 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 what do you call it, Rawi, which is a narrator from the time of the Prophet to this time. So that's number one. You can't access that. That's fine. So, uh, there's some things I cannot access in the Hebrew language, that's fine. But what I will do, if I can't access something in the Hebrew, I go to a rabbi. Yeah, I go to uh, people like, maybe not like you yet, but maybe you're seniors. And they will show me, this is what it says, that's what I say. And I have to respect that because they know more than I do. But you haven't apply, uh, applied that same intellectual humility with the Islamic tradition. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do that with Judaism if, if just because you couldn't find something. You now have a judgment on the whole religion. No, that's number one. Number two is, in fact, if, let me ask you a question. Do you know what is required for a hadith to be seen as authentic in the religion of Islam? It's to be sahih. Okay, how? What, what, is, what makes a sahih hadith in Islam? Well, shut up, man. A chain which is more corroborated? What? It's a, it's, was it a corroborated chain? No, no. no. Alright, so there are five criterion. I can go through them if you like later on. I'll go through them quickly now. 
there has to be muttasil. There has to be a joint, there's a chain of narration which goes back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu The person has to be dabit, uh, has to have either very good memory and or very good writing ability. If either of those or both of those things are not present in a person, even if the person is thiqa, and that's another thing, he has to be adil, yeah, if, even if the person is adil, right, adul, which means that they are good, they are, they are trustworthy and so on, that, that, that narration is not accepted because it's seen as someone who's um, incompetent academically, right? Number four, that has to be free from illa and shudud. And five, that's number five as well. So these are the five criteria. Now, I'm asking a question. If these are the five, illa means defects, hidden defects, either in the sanad, which is the chain of narration, or in the matan, which is the actual written word, or shudud, which means it cannot do mukhalafa, it cannot go against that which another person who is more trustworthy than them has said. These are the five criterion that must be in place for a hadith to be accepted. If you think about it logically, there's only one way in which that can, someone can make a decision whether or not, make a decision whether or not a, ch a chain is narration is, is correct. And that's through comparison, especially in category four and five, shudud and illa. Shudud definitely, because you can't, you can't say that it's more, uh, it's more or less voracious than what other X person has said, unless you know both person's biographies. That's why in the very early times, they did things called Alm al-Rijal, or Ulum al-Rijal, which is the idea of, Dubai. it's called Alm al-Rijal, but it includes women as well. Which is the idea which is that things are written down. Okay, things are written, everybody's, everyone we know, where they lived. In fact, what you're saying is, every, every single one of them, any, any chain of narration, which is graded Sahih, in the religion of Islam, any chain of narration which is graded Sahih in the religion of Islam, okay, that we know who these people are. Even if the, like for example, I'll give you an easy example. If the person is, if person A lives in uh, Azerbaijan and person B, uh, person B lives in uh, Persia and they're in the second century AH and both of them contradicted or the person um, said that he took the hadith from his sheikh or from his teacher and that living somewhere else, that, re that hadith is rejected. For example, I'm giving that. But how, we, how would we reject the hadith unless we know where both of them are living? Yeah, how can we accept it unless we... And, and in fact, he mentioned somebody in his chain, which is, uh, for example, we don't know who he is. The hadith is termed Mu'allaq. Mu'allaq is a da'if hadith, which is Mu'allaq means there's three or four hadith which are weak. One of them is Mu'allaq. The other is Mu'adal, and the other third one is, is Mursal. All of these different, if we need to know who these people are in order to classify the Hadith as Mursal, which means that at a tabaqa of the Sahaba and the companions to the Prophet, we, someone's missing. Or Mu'adal, there's two people missing in the middle. Or uh, Mu'allaq, which is that the person mentions someone and the Sheikh is not there. So this, what you're saying is false. You have not studied this knowledge. You are making claims. You don't know what you're talking about, with all due respect. Yeah, you need, uh, this is an education. I'm not trying to humiliate you or belittle you. But what I'm saying is, Going back to the point, if the point you're making is that preservation of the religion or of Judaism and mass transmission of these people are more, are more, uh, is more voracious, uh, or is the way that you prove your religion, then what we're presenting to you in Islam is much more complicated, much more intricate, much more sophisticated than your system has been is or can ever be it's finished my friend it really is if that is your argument i said to you here today that look whatever argument you make for moses i will make a better argument for the prophet muhammad sallallahu you made your argument based on preservation you said no but the, the chain has people we don't know where their dates are we don't know where they lived we don't know who they are i've shown to you that this is absolutely false i've given you uh, references uh, ibn hajar al-asqalani wrote a book it's called the Litqan. It's kind of like Sirah Alam al Nubala or the Dhabi. Same thing, you know everybody what their name is, what they're good at, what they're not good at. Famously, Asim, who is a narrator of the Quran, he's very good at the Quran, but his hadith is not that good. So we accept him when it comes to the Quran. We don't accept him when it comes to the hadith as much, or that he'll need someone to corroborate him. There's too many particulars here, there's too many intricacies here for its for someone to claim that this is something which is haphazard or something which is uh, uh, superimposed or contrived and there is no historical intellectual way in which you can compare your system where for a thousand four hundred years that's by the way a thousand four hundred years ironically and interestingly is the same time from now to muhammad by the way from now to muhammad is now 400 years imagine 
from the first from the first that was written the first scroll itself forget about the hadith forget about the talmud the first scroll told us that we is a thousand four hundred years between moses and that first scroll so imagine now imagine i'll put it in this way imagine now, hadith no one wrote hadith no one wrote codex and until now until now and i write it i write the hadith now would you say that this religion of Islam is very, uh, very uh, preserved and strong? You say no. You say, why did it take you 14 centuries to write this stuff down? Who did you hear it from? I said, I heard it from my friends who were my, my forefathers and my granddad. Say, my, your granddad lived in Egypt, he lived in this place. Say, how did you he hear it? Say, his granddad. Say, what about his granddad? And then I go and do an ancestry test. And I, I advise you to do the same thing because I don't think, I mean, if you do an ancestry test, maybe 70% is going to come from Estonia. I did an ancestry test, honestly. I, I, I did an ancestry test and I found that I had a bit of Jewish in me, like 5%. 20% was West African and the rest of it was Arab from the Arabian Peninsula. Yes, that's the, I was Arabi, like from the actual Koch, yeah, the Arab. Yeah, so I have a claim. I actually, uh, Muhammad Hajab says, uh, look, my great granddad, and I can go to what do you call Egypt, and I have like this thing called uh, Niqaba to Sad, uh, Sad al Ashraf. They actually have that. It's a, it's a place where you go and you show that you have. Uh, I, my, my family members have that. I can say I'm Ahl Bayt. Therefore, my granddad was the Prophet Muhammad. I can say this. So I, say, I can say this. I can claim. I can claim. And therefore, what my granddad said about the Prophet is true. I can write the Quran down from beginning now. That's nonsense. Sorry to say what historian would accept, but they accept it for themselves. But then they, that's their strongest argument for Judaism. But what I'm telling you, that the companion, the wife of the Prophet, she. And the companion Abu Bakr, he wrote to himself, Amr al Af had his own, Amr al As had his own Sahifa. And, you, and, and then uh, Zuhri, a hundred years after, hundred years after, after all these people, they had the state effort to write this Tadwin Sunnah. You're saying what you have is stronger than what I have? Nonsense, Akhi. No historical, no historian would accept that in, 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 a, in, a, in a blue moon. If what you're saying is that you are, uh, you believe in your religion on those flimsy grounds, then you should believe in my religion 10 times more than you believe in your own. Why? Because there's, there's exactly 10 times more closeness, or more than 10 times, closeness to the source that we have in terms of preservation than you have to yours. It's done, brother. You have nothing. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking honestly, if this is your strongest argument, you must accept Islam, Akhi. You must, because you can see it. I know you, and deep down, bro, I think that you're sincere. And I think today, wallahi, you should say the shahada, bro. Enough is enough. This, wallahi, enough is enough. You, every single, every single interrogation, week after week, I've solved everything for you. You said there's no abrogation. We solved the abrogation. I showed you uh, Deuteronomy. You see that Islam is about Tawheed. Just like Moses, he came with one God, one God, what they worship. And now I'm telling you that the strongest argument you have, the strongest argument you have, we have 10 times the argument that you have. Yeah. <laughs> so where, where, where now? Where are you going now? Yeah, that's it. Please. Please. Okay. Please. First of all, first of all, you seem, you seem to have missed the fundamental part of what oh, I was saying. On. The fundamental part of what I was saying was not the fact that, oh, it goes back to a source when you go back through the forefathers. Just like you can, can go through the forefathers and like the Catholic Church can go through the churches. That wasn't the point I was making. That's not the fundamental. The fundamental is, what is the source? Is the source one man claiming to hear God speak to him, or is it an entire nation of people claiming to have heard God speak to them? It's a totally different okay, ball game. But you've missed my argument. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, continue, continue. And not only that, you talk about arguing from ignorance about systems of transmission. You have no idea about the transmission from Bastin to Bastin through the generations from Moshe Rabbeinu, Olaf HaShonom, I can do it too, all the way down to our present day, right? The, the transmission from Bastin to Bastin, from Av Bastin to his Talmudim, from that Talmud to the next one, so every single generation to, through to today is something unparalleled because the way that somebody would be allowed on a Sanhedrin the way that somebody would be allowed on a Sanhedrin in the first place was they would have to have a total mastery of not only of the Torah, but of the old traditions as well. They would have to be able to know it all Baal Peh, which means totally off by heart, right? The amount of testing that, that went into being allowed to be given smicha, which was the resting upon the heads so that you could be allowed onto the Sanhedrin by the previous generation, by your teachers, was something which, which, which was extremely Josh, let me difficult ask you a question. extremely let me, challenging. On this point, let me just ask you a question. Uh, when do you think Moses existed? 
Moses existed, as in born and died. Yeah. So hold on, let me work it out because if he, if the Torah was given 3,334 years ago, and at the time he was, at the time he was 80 years old. So, so 80 years before that, 3,334 minus 80 is uh, 3,400, whatever. Something like that. Yeah, 3,400. And, and, and he lived for another 40 no years problem. after that. No problem. Because he died at 120 years okay, old. No problem. On his birthday. Okay, fi fine. So, what's the first source? So, what are we talking BCE here? BCE, for those who don't know, you got, we are now in, uh, let's say, AD, yeah? We're in 2021 AD. So, we're here on the timeline, okay? Sorry. <laughs> you got me there, I have to say. Yeah? 2022 AD, yeah? We're here. Yes. You agree? Yes. Alright, so let's that's the timeline. Where is Moses on this timeline? So here's zero, okay? Where is he? A thousand four hundred years, right? Let's, let's work it out. We have About a thousand three hundred years, right? A thousand two hundred? What is it? So, uh, 1,200, okay. Anyone what up? Calculator? Calculator? Someone do it, please. Someone do it. <laughs> 2,022. 2022 minus what? Minus 3334. Three, 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 three. 1,300, as I said, like about 1,000. So here, we're 2,022. This is 3,000, uh, sorry. This is zero. So between zero, yeah, and G and Moses is a thousand three hundred, yeah. Right. Oh, except. Sure. What's your earliest source to Moses? That the side. Earliest, the earliest written Earth, source. Yes. So the earliest written source that exists from the Torah, the earliest fragment, is a Birchas Kohanim um, stone that they found recently uh, in archaeological digs in Israel. No, uh, no, no, not which, stone. I'm talking. I'm talking about the Torah. What is your earliest source? The earliest source for any part of the Torah? Or no, the, the whole thing. Or, or the entire source yeah, of thing. the Torah. The so whole thing. It, it depends in which form you have it. Yeah, right? any, any written in, form. So, in a written form of the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm. which we don't hold to be authentic, okay. but does does exist as a proof that the that the, the tradition was already was still okay. going at that time. Yes. Um, so that takes us to yes. to about yeah. two hundred years before the coming. Like All right. So okay, great. So between that and Moses is a thousand one hundred years. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You're talking to me about historicity. Well, this is ridiculous, bro, man. You started this conversation saying your hadiths were narrated two to three hundred years after Prophet Muhammad, which is false. We showed you it's false. You're talking to me a thousand a hundred years between Moses and the first written source you have, which is equivalent to from the time of Prophet Muhammad sallam, to the Victorian era. Like I said, imagine the time of the Victorian era, the first person that's going to write the Quran is in the Victorian era. I'm putting it in your mind. The first person, the equivalent of what you're saying is that the first person who writes the Quran is in the Victorian era. No, but that's not true because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that that's, that's the earliest that's exactly what you're that saying. we have access to yeah, today. That, no problem. There's a difference. No problem. There's a difference between Fine. saying Fine. the first Fine. Quran that's ever been Fine. written since Muhammad's time. Okay, let me Victorian rephrase. Era. No, no, good. So, to, to, you have a point. To, to say let, that that's let me the clarify it. Let me, Josh, you have a point. If I said, the if we have the only, the first, imagine if us coming and speak as Quran as Muslims, and the first Quran that we have printed in print was from the time of Victoria, Victorian era. What would these people say about us? So your religion is a, a thousand one hundred years, the first person wrote it, about a, a fictitious man that didn't exist a thousand four hundred years, a hundred years before. Bro, what you're saying is nonsense, bro. You're not being fair to yourself. You are disrespecting your intellect. You are disrespecting your intellect, bro. There is a substantive you are disrespecting difference. your intellect. You, you can say that over and over again. No, There's you a are. Substantive difference Josh. again between the two, between these two points, right? If you came now, 2022, saying I've got a, uh, I've, I've, I've just I, I, the, the earliest manuscript evidence for a Quran was Victorian times, 1,100 years yes. after after heard. If you came now, yes. right, that's very different to you coming in in 2,000 years and saying the earliest thing we have was from Victorian times. There's a big difference because if you couldn't, I, it, I didn't get but, that. Okay, if you don't understand the difference, if you don't understand the difference between the earliest manuscript evidence, the earliest Bro, manuscript.
when is that, what, that you have access to right now. When is the earliest manuscript? Ago, when is the, man the earliest access when is the, you have is 2,000 years ago. Josh, when is the it's earliest? When is the earliest manuscript? When is the earliest manuscript evidence of the Quran? It's around now, right? The time of Muhammad, right? The thing in Cambridge. 30 AH in Birmingham. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, 30. Birmingham. So between the Prophet Muhammad's death and the codified, it's like 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, no problem. No problem. Uh, this is reasonable, guys. This is very reasonable. When I say the first manuscript evidence, manuscript evidence is a thousand one hundred. Brother, this is not reasonable. I believe in Moses. Yes. But only because I, Listen, no, no. Yes. Don't tell me what I believe, brother. Really? I don't tell you what you believe. So you believed in him Look, without Muhammad? Yes, there's evidence of Moses. I can give you that evidence without Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the evidence, for example, Marampata. Marampata, you know, Ramses II, after him, he had someone called Marampata. He had a stele. It's called the stele of Marampata. And in the 19th line of that stele, it's a rock written in hieroglyphics. And it mentioned Bani Israel and the children of Israel. Even there's extra biblical evidence of David himself. Have you heard of the Tel Dan stele? Okay, it's a stone, it's a rock, which is, is, uh, it goes, um, archaeological evidence, which says that, you know, uh, uh, Veta, uh, you know, da Davu, uh, Dav how do you say David again? David, David. David, yeah. Veta, it's Beit, isn't it? It's his house. How do you say house? Bias. How do you say house? Bias. Is it bias? Or bias. Bias, bias, bias. We say, oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a different, different, different dialect, yeah. Dialect. yeah. yeah. Well, I'll say, you know, uh, maybe the guy taught it wrong. Anyway, we've got the Tel Dan Stele. The Tel Dan Stele is extra biblical evidence of the existence of David. Just like the Merempetar Stele is extra biblical evidence to the existence of the children of Israel in the time of Egypt. So I don't need the Bible even to believe in these prophets. In fact, to be honest, if this wasn't even there, I'd still believe it because of the Quran. However, these things bolster my belief. Look, we have to be fair and historical about this matter. I don't know if you know in the historic in the, in the in the academic world, there's a guy called Israel Finkel, Finkelstein, not Norman, not normal Finkelstein, not the one that talks about Palestine, not him. There's another guy called Israel Finkelstein. In the beginning, they were they were called the minimalists in, in history. They had this idea that actually the Bible is over exaggerating, blah blah blah, and these things, and they didn't believe in the existence of the house of David. And then they changed their opinion when they saw this evidence. So there is extra biblical evidence. I'm not saying that. I am saying that right now as it stands, as right now as it stands, if you're, you said this yourself, you said that they heard uh, God speak. Yeah, okay, fine. Hearing God speak, hearing God speak is something supernatural, correct? Yes. Excellent. Now, all I've mentioned to you, the 10 points I mentioned, is something supernatural as well. Yes? Is it not supernatural? Yes, we say it's supernatural. It's supernatural. Uh, so, well, your, you, your chain of narration, which brings us back to something supernatural, which is 1,100 years late in terms of codification, is not better than what we have. Moreover, I will say something more important than that. And this is not even the argument. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, one of the scholars of Islam, he says something very interesting. You know what he says? He says that what's, what's different between the Quran and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and all of the other prophets that came before them, is that all of the other prophets that came before them, they had something to see and or hear that, that would make them believe the religion is true. That's what he said. Something for the eyes to see or something for the ears to hear. That's what he said. But he said that the Quran could not be like that. Do you know why? Because Allah says in the Quran, We have not sent you except for all of humankind. So therefore, if the miracle was confined to the people, they would have an advantage in being able to verify it than we do. Because if I hear something directly or see something directly versus if someone told me it, seeing something directly, this is more clear. If for example, I started to walk on water, I go to over there, I start walking on water, all 120 kilogram of me, somehow I'm walking on the water. And you, all 25 kilograms of yourself, walking on water. Well, you probably can. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> maybe it's not a miracle for you, but it would be a serious miracle for me. And then, uh, and then if some people, like the group here that's in front of us, this man, the maniac, and these others here, they started, they witnessed it. Yeah, they witnessed it. Yeah. Say, so, yes, this Muhammad Hijab, 
He went into the water and he walked on the water, yeah? Okay, fantastic. Supernatural thing. Brilliant. Okay, if they saw that, if they saw that, he, he walked on the water, yeah? These guys have an advantage over the other people that came after them. If you got, if we go as a group to our kids and our grand killed and all these other people, you are following me. And all of these individuals. In front. Yes. If, if, let's wait for this guy. Why are you following me? Why are you not following Muslim people? I'm not a Muslim. Why are you following me? I think the man has. Uh, you see. You see the behavior of Muslim people, the way they behave. Why are you following me? Why don't this man is a Muslim man? Okay, okay, yes. Why don't you go and stand in his presence? Why don't you do that? Why are you coming to me? Muslim, why are you coming to me? Why this is a Muslim man? Why don't you go and stand in his presence and disturb him and follow him and obstruct him? Why don't you do that? He's playing the adjective game. Why are you coming to me? <laughs> eh? Why are you coming to me? <laughs> if I say, the Quran says, Muhammad, that Allah teaches pedophilia. So, okay. I say that. The point is, this man that's why we believe, right? That's why we believe that actually, that yeah, the, the Quran, the Quran why don't you go to him? is something which should be analyzable, or the book should be something analyzable by the target audience. The same thing which is why, for example, the the the, the, the extreme miracles or the evidence, we call it the evidence. Why don't you go to him? The evidences of the Quran, because it's called ayat. Ayat is actually roughly translated to evidence. Yeah, the evidences of the Quran. Same word as the verses. Yeah, because each verse is an evidence in itself. Right. So okay, the evidences, the evidences of the Quran yes are things which we today can analyze so I've given you the ideas of the prophecies you've heard some of them but Islam goes deep into prophecies where Islam is going to spread it's going to spread to this country that country we, we or is this going to happen in the future that's kind of lots of prophecies yeah there's a book called the forbidden prophecies which you can read in your own time yeah number one number two is the language itself the language is something which these scopes what all the Arabs have been able to do at that time such that even they, the antagonizers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who are not Muslim, they admitted that this is something which is um, inimitable from that perspective. Okay. Number three, the structure of the Quran is such a, a way which cannot be mimicked, we would say. So we have our set of arguments, I'm not going to spell them out to you right now, but we have our set of arguments which requires or which can facilitate someone of today's era looking into these things now. They don't need to be there when someone is walking in the street or on the water. The point therefore is, if, a, if something which is meant to be for everyone, all human beings, four times, the facilitation of evidence should be for all places all times as well. That's why we believe the greatest miracle is actually the Quran. You see the point? I hear what you're saying. Yes. But you still have kind of missed the point. There is a substantive difference. And by the way, sorry, you can, if you want more details on the miracles and the evidences, go to my website, kbyh.co.uk. Yeah, yeah, kbyh.co.uk. Yeah, yeah. Wow, there's nothing funny You're about that. You're a top-class actor. Um, okay, oh, thank you. kbyh.co.uk and you'll find it's a free PDF you can just uh, download it. Proofs for the evidence of I Islam. I much enjoyed your recital and your debate with David Woods. You, you, your, your showman, it, it's, uh, it's, it's... I think you're starting to get it yourself, man. You've got your own little style, don't you? You've got your own little preacher style. You, where do you get that from the evangelical Christians? You, got, you wag your finger and you raise your voice. Oh, don't try it, man. You've got your own style. But bro, look into it, my friend. Because next week, hopefully, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll be praying with us. As I'm going to go pray now, Asaf. I'm going to pray, Asaf. Pray. Yes? Come on, Think come about on, it. Come on, come on. <laughs> Yo, you, 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 yeah? you, man. Think about it, bro. Hey, make, do make, make, at least do one thing. We'll do one thing. Hey, do Supp supplicate you, to God. Do the best Say, if you, Islam man. is the truth, hey, make my, make, for you, guide me to it. Would you, would you do that? That's what you look Pray like. Pray to God. Ask him. Guide me to a better way. I mean, we, we, we do that in every prayer. Right? Okay, it's no, no. About, you know, but make it specific. Daily prayers, make it again. Ask God to endow Okay, us how about this? Right. Make, supplicate to God and say, if Islam, the religion of Islam, is true and the Prophet Muhammad is a true prophet, then guide me to that way. Fine. Fine? Okay. It's a bit of a that. weird thing to do. It's but, weird, uh, it's, it's not weird. It's it fine. Is. It's a very weird thing to do. It's fine. Right. On that note, I'm going to go pray Asa. That's to me rather than an entire nation's testimony. It's a bit weird to me. Don't, yeah. It's not one man's testimony. We have our tradition. Anyway, I'll see you guys later.